right, everybody, we're going to talk about a fifth type of leukemia known as hairy cell leukemia. This is a rare type of chronic leukemia, and it's probably not as likely to come up on the exam. Um, and if it does, it's going to be straightforward. But it is something that does come up from time to time. So I do want to keep this short, uh, but uh, there are some things that you'll want to know uh, for your test. If you haven't had the chance yet, please consider subscribing to my Patreon. You can get there by clicking the link in the description of the video or on the I button on the upper right hand corner. I very much appreciate all the contributions that I can get to help offset the cost of these videos. And I thank all those of you who have already donated and definitely subscribe to my channel. You'll get notifications every time I put new videos up. All right, so as I said, hairy cell leukemia is a rare type of chronic leukemia. So it has that sort of presentation, very subtle presentation, that involves mature B cells caused by this particular mutation on the BRAF gene. Okay, so what that means is that this is going to be pretty similar to a CLL. And remember that CLL is not particularly dramatic when it presents. So the manifestations include pancytopenia. Almost all of these patients, virtually all of these patients are going to have an anemia. And most of them are also going to have a thrombocytopenia and a neutropenia. Now the total white count may be elevated. Uh, but uh, if you look at the uh, differential or you look at an absolute neutrophil count, um, that's going to be low. Uh, most of these patients will have a palpable splenomegaly and sometimes it can be very significant. And so look for symptoms like early satiety. That's how that commonly presents, abdominal fullness. Hepatomegaly is also seen in many cases. Um, this tends to strike people in middle age. Median onset is 55 years, and there is a 5 to 1 male predominance, so uh, much more common in men than in women, um, even though it's quite rare. All right, so let's just look at a vignette. We got a 59-year-old guy coming into the clinic complaining of a loss of appetite and fatigue. He says it's been going on for the last year, but it's getting worse. He's got a hard time keeping up with his grandchildren and frequently needs to take naps throughout the day. He's got a history of type 2 diabetes that's controlled with metformin. He doesn't take any other medications. He's a former smoker but quit five years ago, and he's lost 25 pounds, or 11% of his body weight, over the last six months since his last visit. Vitals are within normal limits. You do your physical exam, you feel a palpable spleen, but the liver is not palpable. Otherwise, everything is unremarkable. So when you look at this vignette, what stands out? So he's got a loss of appetite and he's lost weight. He's got fatigue. So you got fatigue, looks like anemia, maybe obstructive sleep apnea, but when you take the fatigue along with the weight loss and the petechiae, that is pointing to a cancer. Now we don't know what kind of cancer this is. There's no lymphadenopathy. Uh, for all we know, this could be a lung cancer. He is a former smoker, so we have to keep that in mind. So our differential here would include CLL, uh, mantle cell lymphoma. They look almost identical. Aplastic anemia, other causes of anemia. Probably wouldn't explain the petechiae, but we have to consider other causes of anemia. Uh, lung cancer and esophageal cancer. That would explain some of the early satiety. All right, so our initial workup will be a CBC with peripheral smear. We'll get a metabolic profile. We'll do a CT of the abdomen and a chest x-ray because he is a smoker presenting with cancer-like symptoms. And what we find is that he is anemic, significantly anemic. Uh, he's got an elevated white count and his platelets are low. So this is uh, a picture that looks like a leukemia. Um, now, we would expect pancytopenia, uh, a lot of people think, oh, it's got to be pancytopenia, uh, but it doesn't have to be because you can have elevated white count in leukemia. Um, it's just those extra white cells are leukemic cells, so they're not functioning and therefore uh, you are at risk of getting infection. Um, now, when you get the smear back, uh, you may be told a narrative, it's doubtful, you'll have to look at a, um, at, at a slide. However, 
if you were to have to look at a slide in any case, hairy cell leukemia is a big one because it's got very distinctive cells. And this comes up a lot on step one. A lot of times on step one, they'll show you a picture and they'll say, what's the treatment? Because it's, it's a very specific treatment and it is a very specific appearance of the cell. Everything else was normal except for the splenomegaly, which we would expect since we appreciated it on physical exam. And so our next step, because this looks like leukemia, we need to get a bone marrow biopsy. Now this is a hairy cell. Nothing else is gonna look like this. This is a hairy cell. You see these cytoplasmic projections. It really only happens in hairy cell leukemia. So they can also be a little more subtle, but just kind of look for these ragged borders. Um, this is the hairy cell. And again here. Now this is different from a smudge cell. Go look at pictures of that. Remember smudge cells are seen in CLL. Uh, so we do the bone marrow aspiration and we get a dry tap. This is very, well, I'm not going to say it's very specific for uh, hairy cell leukemia, but if you're looking at a patient that looks like leukemia and you get a dry tap, that really points towards hairy cell leukemia. You get the biopsy, bone marrow biopsy, and if you order it on CCS, it'll probably tell you everything. You can't order flow cytometry on CCS. But some things that stand out is that you have the hairy cells, there's fibrosis of the bone marrow, and then you see these things, a positive trap, tartate resistant acid phosphatase. That is not quite pathognomonic for hairy cell leukemia, but it is one of those things that if you've got a leukemic picture, positive trap, it's hairy cell. Now there's also expression of these various clusters of differentiation. Um, the two that I would really look at is CD11C, not completely specific, but getting there. CD20, because that's gonna impact treatment, and CD25, which is fairly specific for hairy cell. The best initial diagnostic test, like with any leukemia, is going to be a CBC with peripheral smear. We already did that. Monocytopenia is very suggestive. So that's why you want to get your, your differential, CBC with differential with the peripheral smear. Um, if you do get the flow cytometry, which you always would, um, you would see expression of CD11C, CD20, and CD25. And then we talked about the trap stain. And importantly, CD5 is negative. Okay, CD5 is negative. Um, so unlike CLL and mantle cell lymphoma, which will be CD5 positive. The treatment for hairy cell leukemia is cladribine. Okay, it's a purine analog and uh, it works very well for this particular disorder. Now, second line would be pentastatin. Some people say you can use either or, but cladribine is really good because it's a subdermal injection. So go with cladribine. This is how it classically comes up on boards. You get a hairy cell, and then they ask, what do you, how do you treat this? And it's fairly straightforward. Now, if it is CD20 positive, you can add rituximab as an adjunctive. Remember that rituximab is an antibody, a monoclonal antibody against CD20. Now, if it's CD20 negative, rituximab's not gonna do anything. It'll just cause side effects. Um, so if it is CD20 positive, as it often is, you can add rituximab. Now, like CLL, we defer treatment until the patient is symptomatic. Now, most of the time, they're going to be symptomatic if they come in. However, if you were to discover this on a routine CBC and you know you go through your whole workup and it's hairy cell leukemia, if they don't have symptoms, you can wait. Uh, but most of the time when you get a question on boards, um, they're, they're gonna be symptomatic. But just know that like CLL, uh, hairy cell leukemia does not need to be treated until it's symptomatic. Um, so you do need to know this chemotherapy for the USMLE. The leukemias and lymphomas, those are the cancers that do get tested. They do tend to get tested uh, as far as the chemo regimens. You know, if you're dealing with lung cancer, pancreatic cancer, uh, not so much. But, you know, breast cancer, leukemias, lymphomas, those regimens do get tested. So this was our differential. You can see here um, the difference here. Um, we kind of went through this. So to recap, hairy cell leukemia is a rare chronic leukemia involving mature B cells. Uh, it presents with symptoms related to pancytopenia and splenomegaly. The splenomegaly really, um, it can happen in any leukemia, but uh, it really happens in hairy cell. 
Best initial tests of CBC with peripheral smear. Hairy cells are usually apparent. They will be apparent both on peripheral smear uh, most of the time, and they will always be present on the bone marrow biopsy. Another important fact is that this will cause a dry tap because there is so much fibrosis of the bone marrow. Um, so look for that. Uh, the, if you do get the bone marrow biopsy, which you should of course always do, it'll be hypocellular, you'll see fibrosis, and the hairy cells will be present. Immunophenotype, remember CD11C, CD20, and CD25. The treatment is cladribine or pentastatin. Rituximab can be used as an adjunct if it's CD20 positive, and there are a lot of cancers that are CD20 positive, so rituximab is an option in those cancers. And remember that the treatment is deferred until the patient is symptomatic.